All right. Okay, you excited for a parking meter talk? Um, who here likes paying for parking? I know I do. <laughs> so it doesn't seem to be a problem here in the Netherlands that uh, people don't generally have cars um, and because it's very expensive and parking is just another one of those things. Um, okay, so who am I? I'll just give you a quick rundown of who Paul Moreno is here. Uh, I'm the EMEA Security Engineering Lead um, for Uber uh, out of Amsterdam. Uh, but as you can tell by the sound of my voice, I'm American, uh, originally from the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I'm on the advisory board for uh, Bug Crowd, which is a bug bounty hosting platform. Um, a lot more than that, I wouldn't do it justice up here. Um, and then also a company called NanoSec, uh, which is doing application to application uh, authentication and authorization. Uh, it's a startup that nobody's heard of. Uh, and then formerly head of uh, security for Pinterest, which is an sc online scrapbooking site that's very popular in America. Um, growing some momentum out here in, in Europe and then the rest of the world too. Uh, I also like Sound of Light uh, projects, mostly art, uh, long walks on the beach. Uh, and if you'd like to hear more about my Sound of Light stuff, I'd be happy to tell you all about riding a giant unicorn in the desert. All right, so what is this about? It's about uh, the M5 single space parking meter, as you can see right here. Uh, it's very popular in uh, a lot of major US metropolitan areas. Uh, supposedly, it is getting more international uh, presence. I have yet to see them anywhere outside the United States. Um, but these are the meters you'd see like in San Diego, uh, San Francisco, uh, Newark, New Jersey, um, yeah, Chicago, a lot of other major metropolitan areas. So they're, again, they're all over the place. They seem to pop up everywhere. Uh, they're a more modern version of the older ones that just basically take coins or smart cards. Um, these ones have a lot more tech behind them. Um, so parking meters, uh, they're not new in the security space. People have done a lot of, uh, a lot of talks on them. Um, I've actually seen a couple myself. Uh, I've read and found one online that actually caught my attention. Uh, there was a gentleman that works for Raytheon that found a way to strip the chip heads off of a parking meter and read the EEPROM data using an electron microscope and neural network image processing uh, to actually get the code off the chip. Uh, that was a little bit more on the insane side, and there's a little bit uh, a blurb on that one. Yeah, that was, uh, to me, a kind of a, a 10 of 10 when it comes to parking meter talks. Uh, but the guy ended up finding code uh, that was used to exploit the uh, infrared communication channel on it. So he was able to get free parking out of it that way. Kind of nuts. Uh, there's also a more popular one that was done um, at Black Hack back in 2009, um, which was uh, really the exploitation of the smart card system um, because they were not really designed uh, with security in mind, uh, basically anti-fraud protection in mind. So they were able to, uh, to pull off um, uh, smart card uh, payment hacks. Uh, they got hit with a gag order. Um, but at the same time, I guess the bonus is they got free parking, so. All right, so to cover, or what I'm gonna cover today is really um, a little bit about the manufacturer, which is uh, the IP, uh, IPS group, uh, Incorporated. Uh, the hardware, which I actually have up here today, um, assembled. Um, I've basically completely disassembled it for this talk, uh, and then also done a little bit of my own research uh, at home uh, here in the Netherlands. On it, so I'm going to go over the capabilities, um, the identified chips, and little bits and pieces that I've discovered on it, uh, and then also some funny business, a little couple weird things here and there that I've discovered so far. Uh, just so you know, this this talk is not uh, meant to bash the IPS group or the hardware. Uh, this is just me really doing a teardown. I have yet to find any serious vulnerabilities with this, uh, but that is my intent at a later date to hopefully find a little bit uh, something interesting with this, uh, the hardware, uh, or possibly how they manage it. Uh, and then, yeah, again, what's next? All right, IPS Group Incorporated. They are based out of sunny San Diego. Uh, they've been around since the 90s, um, which I, from what I've discovered really started as a cellular communications company, um, which make, makes sense with, with this uh, talk a little later here. Uh, the private venture backed, um, from what I've discovered online using Crunchbase and just news articles, they've got probably to the tune of $2.8 million uh, to fund their business. Uh, they are PCI level one certified, which is a rather difficult level of certification to get uh, in credit card land. Uh, that means they do a lot of transactions uh, per month and per year to do it too. Um, what surprised me too is that I didn't find a single uh, really security engineer that works there. So I found some software developers just using kind of my online sleuthing via LinkedIn uh, and then general uh, searching on the internet. Uh, so I didn't see a CISO either. Um, so 
they are also selling these meters all over the place. Um, again, I, as I said earlier, I've been seeing them in all, almost any major metropolitan area, uh, the single meter uh, style, and then they also have a multi-parking space uh, uh, the, the, uh, device that's basically meant to service like a block or 16, 32 spaces at a time. Um, so overall, this makes to uh, be a very uh, good candidate to produce, uh, you know, uh, 750,000 or so meters out there in the United States, possibly international, um, that handle $850,000 worth of transactions per day per their website. So these meters handle a lot of cash. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, also, not to be confused with, as I found the IPS group, Group IPS, Group IPS, or IPS Group BB, IPS Group Limited, and IPS Group. Um, they have a very generic sounding name. Uh, and all these companies are kind of scattered all over. Uh, they weren't just in the US. I found some of their international ones. Again, the Uber uh, or the um, BB uh, IPS group there is actually based in the Netherlands. All right. Uh, so I did some initial communications with them um, because I'm a bug bounty enthusiast. That's why I'm also a little bit of a proponent for bug crowd. Um, Ask them, hey, do you have a security bug bounty program or a way to uh, ingest reports, like a responsible disclosure program? Uh, which can be silly, like something silly like an email, just to have somebody in the community reach out to them. If, if they say, hey, I found a weird thing with your devices, we should probably talk about it. Um, I had no communications that, or at least no reply and communications back from them via email. Uh, I used a web form on their, on their website, um, written in an ASPX, by the way, uh, and then also support at, just via plain old uh, email. Uh, and then I resulted to going to Twitter, didn't get any response there. Um, and then eventually I went to Facebook. Uh, you'd be surprised <laughs> they have a Facebook page because um, people love to like meters, I think. Um, so I went ahead and, and shot a message to them on their wall. I uh, said, hey, do you happen to have a bug bounty program? Uh, and then here we go. Kind of funny. Uh, no, they're clearly not. <laughs> they clearly must be confusing them with somebody else. Maybe like the IPS group BB or I don't know, I-P-S group out there. Um, so that corresponded, uh, ended pretty quick. I did reply and say, no, I'm talking about you. You make smart meter technology as you disclose there. Um, and I just wanted to find a way to ingest reports. And they suggested I email support at. And as I mentioned earlier, that went nowhere. Um, so maybe at a later date, after I do find a little bit more meaty things to talk about, I'll actually ping them and, and try to get a hold of somebody in real life. Uh, I don't think I'm going to go to support at, though. I'll tell you that. All right, the hardware itself. Um, Maybe a show of hands. Has anybody actually seen these before? Okay, we got one, one couple people in the room. All right, they're very popular, like I said, and they're meant to work in the same old housing that you've seen here. This housing has really been around since like the 50s, uh, back in the days when you just had a, a, a coin slot meter that uh, would only take coins, um, quarters usually, um, and it had like a really rudimentary mechanical system behind it, no electronics, nothing, nothing fancy either. Uh, and then they kind of had next generations that had a digital display um, and then the ability to take smart cards and stuff like that. Um, and as I mentioned, um, I estimate there's probably 750,000 of these meters out there. Um, their website proudly discloses that they have 185,000, um, but after doing a little sleuthing, I was able to find a whole ton of proposals from the company to municipalities out on uh, the United States because it's public information for you to see where your tax money is going. So I found a lot of proposals online that said, we agree to buy 25,000 meters of, uh, at a time or something like that, along with all the services that they um, include, which uh, of course it's uh, cloud managed and stuff like that. Uh, it takes NFC or potentially could take NFC uh, contactless payments. Um, uh, generally uh, allows you to do credit cards via the unit itself um, or like a pay by phone application on your mobile, like an iOS device or Android. Um, and as it says at the bottom, I wanted to point out <coughs> solar powered with rechargeable battery pack. Uh, these do actually have a panel on the front of them so that it can recharge the batteries on board, um, which I found some funny business, which I'll talk about later. Uh, they're also claiming that they're PCI DSS certified. Um, as far as I know, there's no way to actually certify hardware unless it can take a pin. Um, so this is a lie or just maybe misrepresenting the meter. I thought that was a little weird. Okay. All right, so the M5, um, what I've discovered, these things retail for about 485 to 515 US dollars uh, per other online proposals that I found. As I mentioned, uh, a lot of this documentation was freely available. Uh, nothing, nothing like 
no sleuthing, no social engineering. It was all obvious and was plain, plain as day. Um, and then the service support to get these things running takes about $5.75 per month. Uh, that, that's to get them licensed with their cloud management system. And then the wireless uh, fees that they're associating with it. Um, and then I also found, yeah, eight cents per credit card transaction, which I thought was funny. Um, mainly funny because in San Francisco, uh, they used to charge you 45 cents a transaction to use these things. So it's kind of a, a rip off if they're trying to pass that cost to you. They did recently lower it to 27 cents a transaction though. Uh, I don't know any other uh, major metropolitan city that actually uh, charges you to use the card system. Um, but that's what they pay um, or what they should be paying. So it takes your money, as I said, coins, chip cards, smart cards, potentially NFC, which is misleading, uh, which I think the NFC is only to get you to use an app that will read a little, uh, like an RFID broadcast on it so that it'll use that number to pay by phone on an app. So it has nothing to do with the meter. Um, and then of course, cloud manage. What could go wrong with cloud management when you have 750,000 of these things out on the street? Um, and then as they mentioned, they say they're made in San Diego. They actually attest that they are manufactured and assembled in San Diego. Definitely not China. All right, so um, let's see here. They also sell a lot of spare parts associated with these. So generally the proposals I found included maintenance fees and then spare parts like antennas, modules, uh, batteries, um, uh, uh, other, other housing features. They even have an optical sensor that will detect whether a car is parked there or not, basically, or my assumption is that they would call the parking police to come and give you a ticket if you didn't pay. Um, so that being said, let me tell you about my unit, which I've named Parky McPark Face. <laughs> I went back and forth with my friends and they said that I gotta do Parky McPark Face, so that one. Uh, so as I said, uh, there are smart, smart, smart meters that are cloud managed, um, and what I've determined is uh, there's an onboard CDMA modem in this unit, uh, so it's actually running through Verizon. Uh, there's a custom chip there that's mobile to mobile, uh, manufactured by a company named Tellit, and I'll go over that in a little bit too. Um, and as mentioned, they do have an NFC RFID reader on it, uh, maybe, because um, I've had some mixed uh, discoveries on that too. And then they have a credit card uh, reader meant for um, chip cards or regular MagStripe cards, and then also uh, EMV or EuroPay MasterCard Visa like we have here in the Netherlands. So they use the more, uh, I would say the more secure version of credit cards that are out. Um, and then they're solar powered with three chargeable batteries, and I say that in quotations uh, for a reason. And then there's a lot of other identified chips I found on it, um, which I'm just starting to poke at now that I'm getting a little bit more comfortable with uh, my living situation in the Netherlands. Um, all right. So I'm gonna go through the teardown here, which is really gonna go over the three main boards that are in this thing. Uh, the main processing board, uh, the modem, which is also integrated with the solar panel. Uh, and then there's a display slash reader assembly that has a card reader on it. Uh, so it's all in one unit. Uh, also, there's a coin validator in there that's kind of neat. I might tinker with that. Uh, that takes uh, five, five cent, 10 cent and quarters. Uh, might take dollars too. I, I didn't look into that yet, uh, the little, uh, $1 US coins. Uh, there's also other parts in here, the batteries, which we'll go into. I'm excited about those. You'd be, <laughs> I, I just love batteries, you'll see. Um, the antennas, LEDs, which are kind of useless, and then uh, buttons and shit. All right, so this is what the guts of this guy looks like. Uh, this is the main processing board, um, along with the uh, varying components. Uh, there's actually some as you can see, there's some stickers on some of them, which are actually meant to cover up what's actually running under the hood. They have some proprietary part numbers on them. Um, clearly, I, what I assume is to stop somebody like me from reverse engineering it. Uh, it's also covered in this really disgusting weatherproof glue, which is impossible to remove unless you use a razor blade or maybe some other sort of chemical dissolvent. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the dissolving part of it because I like my, my health. <laughs> uh, so just stuck with the razor blade. Um, there's also some cool stuff on here. Um, as you can see the, on the very top side, there's uh, ports for both the display and then the, um, uh, the modem and the solar panel. Uh, there's also some interesting things. Uh, this is a little fuzzy here, but there's actually an I2C port here that's probably got some sort of useful data coming out of it. Uh, the bottom is the power plug uh, for the battery pack or the backup battery pack. As you can see, there's actually a Tatarian battery that's a lithium ion battery cell there uh, that's uh, uh, 310 milliamp hours, 3.6 volts, so it's about a watt of power. 
the whole system, from what I've discovered, is all low voltage, so it's all meant to run at 3.6 volts, not 5 volts, and not anything below that. Um, and then there's also a couple ports here. There's actually some clearly identified debugging ports up at the top, and then some other, uh, what I assume are serial ports, and then what this guy here looks like, is it a daughter board of some sort? Um, or maybe a JTAG interface? I don't think it's a JTAG. It looks more like something's meant to plug in there as an accessory. Uh, and then these two guys here for, I assume, are SIM card holders. Um, as I mentioned, this is a CDMA model, so it uses I IMEI to get on the network. It doesn't require a SIM chip. Um, but I imagine in some areas they're selling it to um, either locations that don't have CDMA towers or Verizon or whomever's uh, running infrastructure there on the cellular network. Um, all right. Okay, digging into this, like I said, there's a rechargeable battery there that's a lithium ion. It's about a watt. Um, uh, I found it uh, silly because it's only a watt battery um, to have this whole thing running. So maybe that just the, that, that's the whole, the whole unit takes less than a watt of power over the course of a day to operate or something. I don't, I don't know. I haven't dug into the power requirements of this thing quite yet. Uh, there's an RFID chip on there on the lower left of the battery. Um, for what I've dug, dug into, it's a Texas instr instrument model that is meant to handle an FC RFID. Uh, it, it was a 13.56 megahertz RFID reader system. Um, and then below that, you can't really see it too well. I think I have it marked by a little magenta arrow. There's actually an NFC RFID antenna on it, uh, which plugs into the side of the reader, or so, plugs into the side of the um, parking meter, and I'll show you that in a little bit here too. Um, there is also, the, I mentioned, I2C ports. Um, there's also, below the battery, is a mixed signal controller. Uh, it's also a Texas Instruments. Um, assumably, it's meant for the uh, NFC RFID management. Maybe, maybe not. Um, or what I'm imagining it's probably used for, too, is there's a Laird chip, on our, a Laird Technologies chip, that big silver block there, um, that is meant for 2.4, uh, maybe 5, five gig uh, frequency uh, communication. From what I could tell, it's disabled on this model, and also it had no hookups, or it had no actual, uh, nothing hooked up to the antenna ports. So the radio seems to be there, but not enabled. Okay. Um, the fun part of this guy is this, the, the main, uh, what I'm calling the, the kind of the master processing unit, which is at, at the top. If I go back a slide here, that top guy that has the white sticker on it, which was a proprietary sticker, I removed it with razors and found that it's actually a TI uh, FPGA. Um, and it's cool because they have a lot of support online for it. It has everything from JTAG operations reference, pinouts uh, of the whole chip itself, the headers, uh, other specifications, uh, also low voltage, and hella warts, which in California is lots, for those that don't know what hella means. Um, it means it's got uh, everything from serial uh, ins, ins and outs, but also some USB uh, capabilities. Um, which on the back side of that board, there is some clearly labeled debug ports, and I imagine that those are tied into this FPGA somehow, uh, which I'll go down to it at some point, maybe in the next couple months. All right, so this is the modem board and solar panel. Uh, the, as I said earlier, the solar panel is probably put, uh, capable of a watt from what I've found on the internet. There's not really many three by three inch uh, solar panels available maybe for hobby kits and stuff like that. Um, but that's really meant to recharge the, the battery systems on this guy. Um, and in the middle there is actually the Tellet, um, Tellet CDMA. It's a, a, a CE910 dual uh, CDMA um, modem that's meant for um, one XRTT. And then I think it's actually only one XRTT. It runs at 900, 800, uh, 1800 MHz. Uh, in the middle of that guy was actually a lot of cool uh, modem ports. So things like ring reset, CTS, uh, stuff like that. So I could actually dig into that and, uh, and run uh, even some AT commands to the thing if I wanted, um, which are also clearly documented online. They actually, all these chips I found lots of documentation for online, which makes me uh, feel like my job will be easier later. Um, and then there's also a weird USB plug at the bottom. Um, I didn't identify it here. This guy right here is actually a USB port and what I assume is a direct interface into the modem. Um, but I don't know where the drivers would be found. I could actually, I probably will email them and say, hey, you got drivers for this? <laughs> uh, and then knowing them, they'll probably give it to me. 
Um, and then also there's, uh, the, right in the middle, there's some interfaces uh, that are probably, again, I presume for some sort of GSM, uh, in, like a daughter board module or something like that. But this is all meant to run on CDMA. Um, so you just, uh, um, to go back to the solar panel, it looks like it's a one watt. And just so you know, that's probably one watt at full direct sunlight. Generally, these are in mixed areas or even in the shade. So you can't really, can't assume that you're going to get one watt hour out of this solar panel uh, through the course of a, uh, uh, through the course of the day, you'll probably get a combined number of watts, but I wouldn't say that you're going to push a full watt uh, every hour. Okay. So as I said, I uh, identified the modem here. It's a Telet C910 dual, uh, CDMA, one XRTT. Um, it actually means I can push a, a little bit more than a megabit of, of traffic through it. This one's meant to run on Verizon, um, which sucks for me because they don't have Verizon here in the Netherlands. Um, so I'm have to figure out how I can actually emulate a Verizon network. Um, and then I also pointed out the USB port there. Uh, this is the display and reader assembly. So it's got like a, I don't know what the, the pixel density is on it, but probably something in the range of 200 by 200, a black and white with a LED backlit. And there's actually a little uh, port there to the right of it that is for the buttons on the front of the thing. So you can add time, cancel, hit OK. And then there's a cool diagnostic button right there, which I found. And from what I suspect, I should, when I go back into the States, I think with a, a clever hairpin or maybe even a paper clip, you could probably press that through the housing. So you could get to the diagnostic without actually opening the meter up. Um, and then there's a cable there is for the credit card reader for MagStripe. Um, most of these, uh, there's actually a pin uh, or a ribbon strip at the top that plugs into the modem, but there's also a reader cable that plugs into the, uh, the main board, the, uh, the master board. Uh, and on the back, I haven't disassembled this thing at risk of screwing it up or making it broken. Um, but there's also some other good chips underneath there. Uh, the smart, uh, or not the smart card, uh, the chip and pin readers underneath there, the mag stripe reader for the cards systems all underneath there. Okay. What else? The coin validator, like I said, I plan to tinker with this. Uh, be fun, because um, it'd be the first time I've ever messed with something that's meant to take uh, a currency and uh, turn it into a digital signal. Uh, I assume it looks like the way it looks like so far, it's got some triggers that seem to measure the diameter of the coin, but it probably has some sort of magnetic uh, reading ability to determine the type of metal so that it's not a fake coin or at least a wooden coin that's the same size of a quarter or a dime. Um, so yeah, this will be interesting to, to play with. I imagine that this whole system is pretty tuned. I could be wrong. It could be total garbage though too. Um, you never know. All right, so there's a whole bunch of other miscellaneous parts that make up this meter. Uh, within the housing, there's the coin validator connector here. Um, there's also actually, uh, you can't see it very well, but there's actually um, a port for external power too, um, which I thought was a little weird because it has the battery connector too. So I don't know what that connector is actually meant for. Uh, this guy here is actually the back side of the LED that's on the front of the device. And then on the left is the other front of it. Uh, then the antenna, uh, the square guy over there says it's an NFC antenna, um, which I thought was weird uh, because it's listed as an NFC antenna in the parts list, but it plugs into the modem. So I assume that it's not for NFC RFID, that it's probably to get the modem some, uh, some signal. That though in the middle is actually labeled explicitly NFC RFID antenna. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't pick up any signal off of them using some off the shelf like Android applications to pull uh, to see what kind of uh, NFC or RFID uh, frequencies are being pushed out. So I don't know what it's using. But I do know that the chip that I said earlier, the t Texas Instrument uh, NFC RFID module is meant for things like MyFair, which is a very common type of RFID card out there. <coughs> some of them are encrypted, some of them aren't. So, All right, so batteries, well, as I was mentioning earlier. <coughs> I put a little arrow next to this guy, and you'll see a close-up of it here. <coughs> As you can see, it's, it says it's uh, made in China, which is clearly in San Diego somewhere, um, and then assembled in Mexico, probably in San Diego too. Uh, and then what really kind of took me by surprise is it says it's a lithium ion battery, um, which is typically a rechargeable battery. Um, and so I learned uh, after almost setting my house on fire that this is not a rechargeable battery, 
because it got really hot. And I'm like, why is this thing not charging? I, I've been letting it sit on the charger for like eight hours. And so I dug into the label a bit, and I was like, OK. Uh, what tipped me off was actually the capacity of the battery. It says it's 9,000 uh, milliamp hours or 9 amp hours. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no chemical density of lithium ion that can actually produce that kind of uh, wattage out of this battery. So I started digging into it. And um, other than discovering it's not rechargeable, I found out they're a totally different chemi chemistry. They're lithium thionyl chloride, which is a disposable battery. Um, so it was weird that they actually put a disposable battery pack in there, meaning that you'd actually have to service this battery after a certain set of life. Uh, this will eventually die, even with the solar panel in it. Um, so go in a little bit of math mode. So let's say there's 12 hours of daylight in a day, and then you, maybe a third of that would produce full solar wattage on the solar panel. So if we're lucky, we're like six watts of power a day, maybe. I'd say five watts is probably a little bit more realistic. But the battery on the, mother, on the main board is only a one watt battery. So you're basically not charging anything uh, the whole, after that battery is charged. So they could have actually put a lithium ion backup battery in there and charged it uh, with a trickle charge after the main battery is charged. But I'm not a parking meter engineer. I just found this out. Um, I, f I did find that these batteries are cheap as shit. They're like a dollar a piece, uh, probably cheaper in mass if you can get them on like uh, actually with a direct manufacturer, but on Alibaba, they're like a dollar if you get them at a thousand at a time or something like that. All right. So I'm about at the end of my talk here. I went through the batteries, which was probably the only funny business I found. Oh, by the way, I did, what annoyed me was not the fact that they mislabeled the battery lithium ion when it's not is that they actually charge cities $30 per pack. So these batteries have like 100% markup, you know, some disgustingly large markup, and they're guaranteed to die. They're not going to actually be charged. So cities and your tax money in the United States is going towards these, which are intentionally meant to fail. Um, so if you think about it, there's a the cost of the battery, and then you got to send somebody out there, either a technician or a parking meter that's trained on how to replace them. So whatever cost is associated with that, in San Francisco, you have 22,000 parking meters out there. So do the math, that adds up pretty quick just to be, uh, just because somebody failed at engineering on uh, the power systems. All right, so what I wanna do next, um, crossing fingers and hopefully some magic happens and I actually get some community friends to help out or I buy a lot of expensive equipment. I am gonna try to take a stab at reading the firmware off the FPGA. Uh, both the main one, and then as I mentioned, there's that uh, 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 signal or, uh, wireless uh, signal processing one. So that one might may or may not be useful, but I hope that it is. Uh, I think if I can actually get some firmware off there, um, which per the website says it's password protected, so I might be totally failing at it. Um, but given the company doesn't even know uh, what a bug bounty program is or how to re do responsible disclosure, they could have just have an oversight and not put any password protection on this. Uh, I do want to get it back online. I have a Samsung network extender that's meant to throw up a Verizon CDMA bubble. Uh, the problem is that uh, some colleagues uh, at ISEC Partners uh, a couple years back found some major vulnerabilities with these network extenders and then they disclosed them to Samsung and they closed all of them up. So I can't, uh, unless I find an older one or if, if I can flash the firmware to something older, I can't trick the GPS into thinking that it's in the United States, because these network extenders are only meant to work in the United States. All right, I'm going to take a look at also the modem AT commands, uh, possibly intercepted if I can get like a software-defined radio or something that'll actually let me analyze it. And then d depending on whether or not it, uh, setting up an encrypted uh, connection, uh, I may be able to read it, maybe not. Uh, who knows, maybe replace the firmware. And then of course, free parking, maybe. Who knows? That's it. I, I got somebody, somebody that has a question already, so.
So like a kit or something like that that's meant? Like a kit? Like a kit that's versatile to read? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure, I'll, I'll get a hold of you after the talk then, actually. That's something I'd be interested in hearing about. Okay, guys. Um, sorry to break up. Oh, we're already uh, out of time. Yeah, we're already out of time. Shit. So you can talk to me afterwards. I'll be happy to answer questions. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you again. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, guys and girls. Thank you. <laughs>